So today we'll talk a little bit about uh, neural networks. So actually the next, uh, I think, three or maybe even four lectures, so a lot of the rest of the semester we'll be talking about uh, neural networks because they've be become quite important. <clears throat> Thanks. <laughs> Wait. Okay. Um, so today we'll mostly talk about things that are classical and like uh, later foundations to some of the more advanced techniques. And um, the next two lectures we'll talk about some more advanced techniques and um, some more uh, modern approaches. Um, yeah. Generally, in this lecture, we'll probably take. Um, keep it relatively simple. We're probably not going to talk about recurrent neural networks at all because um, we only have so much time and uh, there's a lot of stuff out there that you can explore that we won't get to. So as I said, what we're going to talk about today is pretty classical. So nearly everything um, we're talking about existed about 1990. Uh, as you might be aware, there was like neural networks were a big thing in like the late 80s and early 90s, then basically completely disappeared from machine learning research uh, for about 20, 10 to 20 years, and then in about um, 2008 started making a comeback. And uh, now they're super pervasive in industry applications. And so um, what changed, so why did they become fashionable, fall out of fashion, then become fashionable again? So basically they fell out of fashion because they weren't really working well on the data sets that people try to do machine learning. Um, and they're very slow. So what changed now is that we have vastly more data. So neural networks um, work best if you have really big data sets and you're trying to learn quite complicated models. If you have like, let's say 10,000 samples or 100,000 samples, uh, you could you maybe try uh, training a neural network, but, but probably for 10,000 samples or even less, um, gradient boosting often works better. If you have something that's very structured, like um, images or sound or text, neural networks uh, can work much better because they can exploit the structure of the data better than other algorithms like gradient boosting. And so, um, we have much, much more of this data than we had in the 90s. Like, we have basically infinitely many images, we have infinitely much text, and we actually have uh, annotated data sets of this. Um, the other thing is that we have much faster computers. In particular, people are now using GPUs to, um, uh, to do deep learning or to do neural network learning. I think my lab that I was in Germany actually was like one of the earlier ones we started doing this in like 2008, maybe? Um, but now, like this is like a, a very big thing, and it's like um, probably the most useful graphic cards these days is not actually doing graphics, but uh, training neural networks. And uh, this is quite important because, as like I said, um, neural networks are particularly good at very complex models for big data sets. And so this means you also want pretty big models. And training bigger models takes more time. And so having much faster computation is. Um, yeah, uh, helps us a lot. And we'll come back to this uh, later. There is a couple of improvements that um, each of them significantly advanced state of the art, um, like in the last, let's say 10 years when they appeared. Uh, we'll not talk about these today, but in the next uh, two lectures. Well, we talk about the first one, which is the ReLU um, nonlinearity, and we'll talk about dropout, Adam, which is an optimizer, batch normalization, and residual networks. And these are basically all sort of uh, tricks and techniques that people came up with, and they all improved um, the technologies quite a bit. But even without any of these tricks, neural networks would still be quite competitive if you have a large enough data set. All right, so let's start from the beginning. Neural networks are often written down as like literal networks. And um, so here I have a depiction of how someone uh, would write down logistic regression as a neural network. Um, so by now you hopefully are all familiar with uh, logistic regression. So here we would have uh, four inputs for a four-dimensional data set, say, and we have a single output, which is the probability of the class being uh, zero or one. Let's say the probability of the class being one. 
And um, so the nodes corresponds to, um, to variables here, and the errors usually correspond to um, multiplication with parameters like weights. So here uh, we have uh, four weights, one for each input, we multiply them, and then we add them all together in the output, and what's not shown here is the output also has nonlinearity, the logistic sigmoid that we saw. Um, you could also draw the bias in here as an additional like um, fixed node. I left out the bias for simplicity. But this is how you read this. So each of these errors corresponds to a single weight, and each of these nodes corresponds to um, a single variable input or output or intermediate result. Maybe an important distinction here is that these are very, like, I drew something similar in the lecture on um, latent directly allocation and possibly also in the lecture on um, mixture models. There, these were graphical models, which are probabilistic models. And the nodes in probabilistic models correspond to random variables. And it's like, if this is a very formal framework, how you describe probabilistic uh, um, model. These here are just like illustrations. Here, the nodes don't correspond to random variables or to any model. These are just sort of numbers in your algorithm. So here, these circles and nodes, uh, these circles and arrows mean something completely different and much simpler than in the graphical models. All right. Um, so the basic architecture of a neural network then is this. Um, we have an input layer, let's say, as for our logistic, re logistic regression, we have four inputs, um, a hidden layer with uh, five nodes, and an output layer with, say, a single output for binary classification. And so this would be called um, possibly an MLP, which stands for multi-layer perceptron, which says we have more than one layer, because there's a second hidden layer, or a vanilla neural network. Um, so what it represents is that we have um, our input vector, like here shown as four-dimensional. Um, there's a matrix multiplication by some matrix W1 of the input vector, uh, and then I add some bias B1. In this case here, W is um, five times four, so there, because there's four input uh, neurons and five neurons in the hidden layer, so this uh, multiplication for single input um, x, we would get five numbers out. We add the bias, which would be of length five. And um, then we apply nonlinear function f. This gives us the numbers in here. And um, then um, to go to the output, we do another matrix multiplication. So here, this is actually just a vector because we only have one output. So this would be a vector of length uh, five that we multiply, we, and then we get uh, the output after we add the bias B2, which is just a single number for the one output. And then we have another nonlinearity. Let's say um, for uh, classification, we can use the logistic sigmoid. So this is just a, the computation graph, what you would do if you want to compute a prediction for a single sample. Um, we'll talk about how, how are we going to learn this in a little bit. Um, but maybe let's talk about this prediction mechanism first. So basically, you have a matrix multiplication, a nonlinearity, another matrix multiplication, another nonlinearity. Um, so why are, that, why are these functions f and g there, and what are they? Uh, if you just had matrix multiplication after matrix multiplication, then it would, only, would correspond to just one matrix multiplication and your model would still be linear. In the last lecture, we had something where we had uh, two matrix multiplications, everything was linear in the word embeddings. The trick in the word embeddings was that we were um, not interested in the final model, but we were interested in compressing something down through this bottleneck we had. And so that may, it meant that uh, even though we used linear matrices or linear um, models, we still learn something interesting. Here, it's important that we have this f and g to learn something interesting. Otherwise, we'll just learn logistic regression, but more complicated and more computationally expensive. Because, yeah, if h wasn't here, we could just write this as w2 times w1 times x plus b1 plus b2. 
Okay, here is sort of a different architecture where you can see you can add more layers in between, which means you have more, um, uh, more matrix multiplication. So each of these things here with as many errors, so each, um, each error corresponds to a single number, but as a whole thing, this connection here corresponds to matrix multiplication. So for each hidden unit, we basically have one coefficient for each input unit. And the deeper you make this and the more hidden um, units you have, the more complicated the function you can learn. Usually these days, um, you have usually hundreds or thousands of uh, hidden units. Um, traditionally, you had usually like one, two, three, four hidden layers. Now with these uh, more modern tricks, people have like um, 20 or 100 hidden layers uh, with very specific structures. But so the two ways to make this model more complex is to make it wider, so have wider um, hidden layers, or to make it uh, deeper, so have more hidden layers. And this is where the term deep learning comes from. So deep learning, when it started, was deep because it had like three hidden layers instead of one hidden layer. Uh, but these days now we have like, it's actually deep because it has possibly like 100 or so. Oh, here in this example, you also see um, multiple output um, units. So if you do multi-class classification, it's the most common case where you have multiple output units. It's similar to multinomial logistic regression, where you might have one probability estimate for each class. So here you would use a, a softmax that we uh, already saw before. Uh, to, and so you usually have um, as many output units as there's classes. Another thing that you could do here is you could, uh, if you in a regression setting, you could try to learn several outputs at, at once. So um, let's say you want to regress two different quantities from some input. You could have uh, separate outputs for each of the quantities you want to uh, you want to model. All right, so what are these uh, nonlinear activation functions, these f and g? So the output layer usually is special. As I said, usually this is, um, well, if you do regression, it's usually the identity, so you don't do anything. And uh, if it's classification, you usually do logistic sigmoid or softmax. Um, but within the model, you usually have one of two activation functions these days, uh, 10h and the rectified linear unit. 10h is what, um, people traditionally used, it has sort of um, at least some vague biological uh, motivation, basically that each of these units, which is also called a neuron, is either on if you're sort of in this saturated area here, or it's off when you're in the saturated area, and they are sort of a soft switch for the neuron between being on and off. Um, people have found out this is, well, one of the issues for like the 20 years of uh, AI or neural network winter was that it was kind of hard to optimize these. And people found it's much easier to optimize if you use um, rectified linear unit, which is uh, this guy. So this is just the identity if it's positive and zero if it's negative. So you're just cutting off the zero part or everything is slower, uh, smaller than zero. So because it's much easier to compute the gradient of this guy. Of course, uh, the gradient um, for the 10H vanishes both here and here because the function gets very flat. Here, the um, gradient is very simple in the positive, and people, I mean, the, the gradient vanishes in the negative, but people have now come up with tricks to make the gradient here also be like better. So, these days, basically, ReLU is what's used in uh, nearly all neural networks. Okay, so this is sort of the basic architecture, and now I want to talk a little bit more about uh, the use and how these are uh, trained. I already uh, talked a little bit about this in the beginning, so I mean, they have many, many applications. Um, 
We will mostly be talking about uh, nonlinear models for classification and regression. As I said, they work very well for large data sets. Uh, one of the big issues that remains is with optimizing them. So finding these Ws and Vs is um, hard because these models are pretty big and also because it's mathematically ill-defined or it's um, not ill-defined, but it's impossible to find the optimum solution because the problem is not convex. So we'll run um, gradient descent that we talked about last time and we'll find some local optimum, but it's not guaranteed to be the global optimum. So how you do this learning will, Im uh, will impact what solution you end up with and you might end up with a bad solution. Um, though people have argued recently that you'll probably end up with a good solution if you don't mess it up too badly. But uh, it's sort of um, how to actually find the um, parameter is still a bit of an open question and there's a lot of tricks and hacks going on. Uh, people used Adam for a long while and then someone found out that there was a mistake in the proof of Adam and the algorithm is um, like obviously not correct and doesn't converge in simple cases. And, um, but it was used successfully in industry applications for like, I don't know, a couple of years before that. Um, so like things might work even if they're broken or things might not work and you don't know why because the non-convex optimization is very hard to make any statements about how good your solution will be. Give me two more slides, okay? Um, I was gonna ask this question to you, but anyway. Um, oh yeah, so um, and, uh, before I go into the training more deeply, as I said, so these are notoriously hard to train and in particular for bigger data sets, you need GPUs. Um, I'm probably gonna have you use Google Colab for the last, um, for the last homework, so you don't have to use your own GPUs. We'll have some of the homework be on CPUs, but that's gonna really take a long time, and I don't want you to mess with that. We're not gonna try and um, actually build a big neural network from scratch, because it's like too annoying and takes too much time, and I don't want you to mess with that. Um, oh yeah, so neural networks require, uh, basically they work on these matrix multiplication and nonlinearities, so, um, they sort of work in the metric space, which means they require pre-processing, similar to um, linear models and SVMs and unlike trees. So everything needs to be nicely expressed as like well-behaved continuous numbers and the input representation might be quite important for how well the neural network works. And yeah, and so there's many variants and every day I'm sure t uh, ten, at least 10 new papers are published in archive that come up with a new variant of neural networks. Uh, we'll talk about uh, convolutional neural networks which are used uh, mostly for images but also for audio and some for text. Uh, there's the current neural networks in different flavors, recursive neural networks for working on graphs, and then all kinds of feature extraction methods. Um, recently, generative uh, serial networks have gotten a lot of press where they create um, a very complex representation, um, sorry, a very complex generative models where people create images from, from nothing. So you have a model that can generate a new face, um, which is interesting. Um, and one, something else that got a lot of press is deep reinforcement learning, which is now being used to play lots of games. So uh, it this was used to do basically make um, computers better than humans at Go, now by a pretty long shot from what I understand. Also, uh, I think StarCraft is pretty, pretty close to being uh, human level, and I think yesterday there was a game of Dota or something. I don't know if anyone saw that. Um, but so, at least in a very these relatively restricted domains, uh, deep reinforcement learning is, um, yeah, uh, it's solving a lot um, pretty complex problems and we're not gonna talk about any of this. So let's come back to um, low level, how do these things work? So 
Here I gave an example. This is uh, the smallest neural network you can think of. Basically, it has one hidden layer that I call h. So I have my input, which is a vector of floats. I multiply it with by w1, add my bias b1, uh, apply f. f is the rectified linear unit um, for like usually now these days. Then I do another matrix multiplication and add another bias b2. And then I um, do my output, output nonlinearity. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use sort of standard optimization techniques, meaning um, we're going to try to optimize a loss of the output and our um, uh, and the uh, known label. Um, so here, basically, the loss usually would be something like squared loss for regression or cross entropy for classification. So cross entropy is the guy if we are using a logistic regression. So this is the same objective, basically, as in logistic regression or linear regression, only that the function O is not just a linear function of the input, but it's like this guy, which is much more complicated, which is here not that complicated, but still two matrix multiplications and two nonlinearities. So, and the way we're going to solve this minimization problem is uh, by gradient descent. So we're going to compute the gradient and then walk in the direction of the negative gradient. For, as I said, um, I think last time, talking about gradient descent, if this was a linear model, there's very eff effective um, and efficient methods available to solve this. Because this is a nonlinear model and this is non-convex optimization, this is very hard to solve, and so we are basically just falling back to gradient descent. When, someone, when people talk about neural networks, they also always talk about backpropagation as the learning mechanism, um, which I find a little bit um, confusing. So what, what we're actually just doing is we're doing gradient descent on this, um, on this function. And so we're doing gradient descent on Ws and Bs. Backpropagation is a way to efficiently compute these gradients via a chain rule. So I want to briefly talk about what backpropagation is. So let's say we want to learn the W1. So we want to learn, obviously, uh, all of this. But let's say we want to compute the gradients of W1. Um, so we want to compute the uh, gradients of the loss of um, the true known Y. The, uh, known y and the output we generated O with respect to say W1 and then we can um, decompose this by a chain rule as the derivative of or the partial derivative of the output um, by um, H which are the, the hidden activations of the layer above W1 um, by the activation H derived by the um, input to the nonlinearity. So this guy here is what, what we compute after W1 before nonlinearity and the input before W1. So there's, so whenever you um, compute a gradient for uh, any of these matrices, you have the part that is for the layer above, for the layer below, and for the, and the derivative of the nonlinearity. And um, so you can, if in the, so you need the, the input to every layer. So uh, during your training, you need to compute this uh, first. So you need to see what is the prediction of the model. You, you compute the in, um, input to every layer, uh, just sort of computing the function. And then you can um, compute the back propagation of the gradient uh, by going back through your network. So you first can compute the output um, uh, the partial derivative by the uh, hidden unit for the last layer, then you get, then you can use that to compute the one of the layer below, then you can compute that one of the layer below, and so on. So backpropagation is basically combining um, something like uh, dynamic programming with the, using the chain rule. So it's just a sort of nice application of the chain rule to compute all of these gradients. You could also tr just sort of brute force compute all of these gradients and say, I'm going to compute gradients for W1, for W2, for W3, for W4. If you do that, you do a lot of re uh, redundant computation. Backpropagation just does it in a smarter way.
The details though of this are not super important because luckily these days no one has to implement this um, themselves. Like I had to do many years ago. <clears throat> okay, but so we, we had this question, um, but what, what about the kink? And um, so this is, the ReLU unit is uh, non-differentiable in this point, so there is no derivative um, here. So technically what we're doing is not gradient descent, but subgradient descent. Subgradient descent works the same way as gradient descent, only if there's no derivative in a point, you, you can use any of the subgradients. Meaning, uh, subgradients is basically everything that's, every line that's below the, the function. So a possible subgradient would be like, so basically there's, there's a set of tangents in this point that are all valid. So, and they're bounded by this line and this line. So these would both be um, valid subgradients, but also any, any of these lines. Like any, any of these is a, uh, is a valid subgradient. And so the math works out if you pick any of them. In reality, you, this is, uh, in reality you never hit the zero. So, uh, because it's floating point operations. But, uh, so you don't actually have to worry about it, but uh, if you want to worry about the math, uh, formally it's separating descent. Is there a learning rate, I guess, to update the weights? Wait. <laughs> um, question is, is there a learning rate? And yes, that's what we're gonna come to next. Um, I, I hope. Give me one second. Oh yeah, so many slides. Um, so I already talked a little bit about uh, batch versus online uh, last time, just to repeat this again. So the standard would be to um, compute the gradient of the whole function and then update the parameters. So the function here is the loss over the whole training set. And so we compute the, uh, the gradient with respect to this function, the, whole, the loss over the whole training set, then we update the parameters. If our neural network is very big, it takes a long time to, uh, to this computation, and so we'll have um, a lot of computation just to make a single update. So instead, what we can do is we can either look at a single example at a time or at a mini batch, and these are all both stochastic approximations of the original function, where instead of looking at the whole sum over all training points, I'm just looking at a part of the sum. Um, so it's stochastic if you sample the points at random, usually we just scan through the data set. And so um, then we need to do way less computation to do the same number of updates. I also already mentioned last time, I think that, um, so the standard thing to do these days is mini batches because uh, of the way that uh, matrix multiplication is implemented. If you have a single input vector uh, and a and do the matrix multiplication for each in, uh, single input vector, it's gonna be much slower than if you do matrix multiplications. Um, so basically, usually you have a batch size, which is like some small power of two, like 32, 64, 512, something like this. And you always process this number of samples at the same time. And there's a trade-off between how long it'll take you uh, to compute a gradient, um, and how stable the gradient is. So uh, here, oh, uh, uh, here basically I put in a fixed learning rate. I'm not sure about last time I, I also had a fixed learning rate. So eta would be what is the step size and um, there's many ways to sort of pick the step size. Generally, constant eta is not, not good, so you want to make bigger steps at the beginning and smaller steps at the end. Um, people also found out it's better to have a different uh, step size for each parameter. So for each entry in each of the matrices, you might have a different step size. And you dynamically uh, adjust the step size um, during learning. And there, there's, uh, if you're familiar with Newton's method, there's some similarities vaguely with Newton's method, where um, in Newton's method, you 
uh, try to estimate, or you, you have the second derivative, and depending on how big the second derivative is, you make bigger steps. Um, here, there's something similar, where we're not actually using the second derivative, which would be too expensive to compute, but we're tracking something about like how smooth is the function, and if the function is smooth enough in this direction, we're gonna make bigger step sizes. When I made this slide last year, Adam was state of the art. I'm actually not sure if it's still state of the art. This was also before people found out there was a bug in it. Um, um, I think now, possibly Adam without the bug is the state of the art, but maybe also not. So things are moving pretty quickly, and there's many heuristics uh, out there. There's like, yeah, there's so many heuristics that uh, it's kind of hard to keep track of them. Um, I think, yeah, I give you two references here. This is probably Adam, and the uh, bottom is like talking about different heuristics, but this, is, uh, this blog post is a year old, so it has only half of the heuristics that are available now. A good idea is I'm gonna talk about deep learning frameworks later. Uh, what we're gonna be using is Keras in this class. Look at the Keras documentation. They will have all the different options, and probably they will, they will have the good ones implemented. Um, but yeah, but all of the sort of state-of-the-art options all have adaptive learning rates and a different learning rate for each weight. Oh, okay, this is sort of beyond the scope of this class, but uh, given that I had this question, so there's actually um, a nice paper called Learning Gradient Descent by Gradient Descent, where you train a neural network to predict the learning rates what awaits in a different neural network. Think about it. So, yeah. So basically you learn a gradient, you learn a neural network that tells you how to best learn a different other neural network. And that actually works better, which is not surprising, but it's like, what is even happening? Um, yeah, anyway. Look at the heuristics, there's many to choose from, and a bunch of them work well. Oh yeah, um, I guess here also some recommendations. So for small data sets, you, usually, you really shouldn't be learning uh, neural networks, but if you do, you can use off-the-shelf solvers like LVFGS, that's the second order uh, map, or approximate second order method. That's what we're using in scikit-learn uh, for small data sets. And I'm gonna use this for all of the demonstrations because I'm gonna use like small 2D toy data sets and that works well there. And I don't have to worry about tuning anything. Um, for bigger data sets, Adam and RMS prop as I said, and there's like a whole series of other ones that tune per weight learning rates. And um, some people swear also by actually having a single learning rate and tune the schedule. And some people, do something like um, you have a constant learning rate, and when you stop learning, like on a validate on a whole lot of validation set, once you start overfitting on a validation set, you have the learning rate, um, or something like this. So you have actually heuristics that rely on the validation set to set the um, let the le learning rate. So people have done all kind of things, and uh, at least in earlier state of the art papers, um, like early ImageNet papers there was a person sitting in front of the monitor clicking buttons to set the learning rate. Um, so this is like, it's a, it's a lot of fun. <clears throat> but yeah, so if you, if you use something like ARM, Atom or RMS prop, you're usually, you'll be fine, you don't have to worry about it. Um, so that's probably what I would suggest. So, now I want to talk a little bit about um, how this works on long, like, some toy data set with scikit-learn. Scikit-learn really, um, because it has no G GPU support, you shouldn't really be using it for any bigger data sets. If you're already using scikit-learn and you say, oh, how about I try a neural network? It might make sense to try it out, but really if you want to be serious, um, I would suggest using a different framework, probably Keras or PyTorch. So if you want to use scikit-learn, there's MLP classifier and MLP regressor. 
uh, by default, I have one hidden, uh, hidden layer, I think, with 100 units. And so here, I'm using my favorite data set, uh, uh, the two moons. And um, so you can see, because it's a toy data set, the solver is LBFGS. I think by default, uh, actually, I'm not sure what, the, by default, the solver is a stochastic gradient descent of some form, probably with exponentially dec decreasing um, learning rate. And you can see here, OK, it it's learns a like, relatively smooth function, and it perfectly fits the data set. So here, because I didn't tune anything, it, it totally overfits uh, the data set, as you can see here and here. But uh, really, it is like a very flexible model. Um, one thing about neural nets is, as I said, the optimization is non-convex. So um, the result you get depends on both the optimizer and on the random initialization you use. So here, I just varied the random state. And you can see that you get uh, somewhat different models depending on how you initialize uh, the model. Some people actually use this. So if you look at the um, uh, winners of like competitions, they usually use multiple neural networks trained on different random states and then averaged. I think I suggested something else, uh, something similar like for people using gradient boosting on, on Kaggle. So if you want the really like the last fraction of the digits uh, of the accuracy, you just um, change the random seed and you do an ensemble. In practice, I don't think these are used very often because Every single one of them is so computationally expensive that it doesn't really pay off. Okay, so the main, so let's say we kind of uh, fix the solver here and we don't worry about the optimization too much. Uh, the main parameters of the model are um, the nonlinearity and the hidden layer sizes. So here is what happens. If you have a single hidden layer of size five, um, here we can also clearly see this is a rectified linear unit nonlinearity. If I only have a single hidden layer of um, size five, what I actually get is um, a piecewise linear function with five pieces. So like right now I only see four, but the model has the potential to create five pieces. This is basically what it means to have five hidden units in a rectified linear um, model. So rectified linear model, it will obviously be always piecewise linear because it's either zero or linear. And so your uh, decision boundaries will always be piecewise linear. Here, the piecewise linear, let's say, go back here, was not as obviously maybe because we had 100 hidden units and so it looks pretty smooth. Um, so here, with five hidden units, clearly the model is very simple. Um, we can change both the, the number of units in the layer or the size, sorry, or the number of layers. So here I have three hidden layers, each with 10 units. So here I have two input features, 10 hidden units, 10 hidden units, 10 hidden units, and then um, a one output unit. I'm not actually sure if it implements it with one or with two output units, but it's a binary classification problem. And you can see it can um, create a much more complex model. We can also change the nonlinearity to 10H. If we do that, you can see that the model becomes much smoother. So this was piecewise linear. This is um, 10H. So now it kind of looks smoother, but people mostly don't use that anymore these days. Um, so similarly, we can do some, this for regression with MLP regressor. Here I have um, a function that is I mean, some sinus wave with some slope. And again, by default, we have 100 hidden units. And so we can uh, pretty much overfit this quite well. Um, it's a 1D problem, though, and so um, I mean, you can on, only overfit so much. Again, you can see the 10H is so is um, much smoother than the rectified linear units. 
or not too much smoother, a little smoother. Say a little smoother. So generally, um, picking the architecture, so picking how many hidden layers and how big a hidden layer is um, a bit of an art. If you, we will talk about um, more complex neural networks next time, and there's many architectures that people already rely on. So if you do computer vision, there's like a set of architectures. You're just you're not going to try to make up your own. You're just going to pick one that someone else came up with, and it worked well for them. Um, if you have a completely new problem and you just want to train like your your standard vanilla neural network, um, the main thing you need to think about is how many parameters are in the network? Do I actually? Nope. Okay, I don't have the slide that I wanted. Um, so the, n the number of parameters in the net network, um, and also the size of each of the hidden layers. If you have, um, let's say you have a th thousand dimensional input, and then your second hidden layer is two dimensional, and then the layer afterwards is thousand dimensional, and then another thousand dimensional, and another thousand dimensional, and then your output, then um, you might have a lot of parameters in your network, but if in the first, I mean, in the first step you need to reduce everything to two dimensions, you'll probably lose all the information. And so the model will not be able to like, really learn something useful from that. So um, a, a common thing is actually to have most of the hidden layers be the same size. Uh, and if anything, then the ones that are closer to the input are usually uh, bigger than the ones closer to the output. But, but very commonly, you just have like, um, you pick one size, like let's say 1,000 hidden units or 10,000 hidden units, depending on how much data you have, and you have multiple uh, layers of this size. But yeah. Picking the right architecture is a little bit of, uh, of an art. There's a bunch of literature on how to automatically select a good architecture, but that's still, um, I don't think that's in a state where people are using this a lot in practice. So there's other ways to control the complexity of your neural network. So I said the main one is the number of parameters and the architecture. Uh, another one is regularization. So as with like Rich and Lasso, you can add, mm, could add L1 or L2 penalties. It's very rare to add L1 penalties, I think, because uh, sparsity in the matrices doesn't make that much sense unless you have very specific structures. But uh, it's quite common to add a 2 regularizer, also known as weight decay. So it basically means to your Oh my God. To your loss function here, you add um, the norm of your weight vectors. So basically, in each gradient step, it means you shrink the weight a little bit unless uh, it was useful. Um, another way to control the complexity of the model is early stopping. That means that during uh, the learning, you have a whole lot of validation set. And um, so the model um, with each gradient update or with each stochastic gradient update will adjust to the training data better and better. So at some point during this optimization procedure, you'll start overfitting, which means that your loss on the training set goes down, but your loss on the validation set starts going up. And so you can just uh, stop optimizing at this point and say, okay, we converge now to a place that is, works well on the validation set, and um, yeah, just keep the model the way it is. That's called early stopping, where basically you don't optimize the function actually to its optimum, but you keep this whole validation set to say when to stop the optimization procedure. Uh, and then finally, um, a more recent method it's now probably also 10 years old, is uh, dropout, uh, which we'll talk about in like 
uh, on, on Wednesday. All right, so let's, let's do some uh, model selection with scikit-learn. This is how you would do this probably only on a toy data set. Um, but just to, to illustrate uh, some of the uh, ways to regularize. So here I um, do pipeline, I have a standard scalar, an NLP classifier, and I want to tune the alpha parameter. Alpha is the L2 uh, regularization or weight decay. So this is the L2 penalty uh, on my weights. And I search them in a log space. So this is how much do I want to put, push my um, weights towards zero. And I'm plotting mean test score, mean training score. And you can see that if I don't regularize at all, I get a training score that's uh, basically perfect. If, and even if I regularize some more, I still get a perfect training score. Um, if I regularize too much, the training score goes down. And basically, both training and validation score are really bad. So here, if I have alpha to, um, to 1,000, then basically it can't really learn anymore. And you can see, well, maybe the optimum is here at, at 10. That's at least what the numbers say. But there, you see there's quite a bit of noise in there. Though, um, if I have the choice, I would always pick the simplest model. And so here, the, this is the strongest regularization. So I would probably pick the model with alpha equal to 10 course it has the strongest regularization and has very good uh, a very good test score here similarly I can um, search hidden layer sizes so here I have hidden layer sizes either a single hidden layer with 10 units 50 100 500 units or with um, two hidden layers with 10 units 50 units 100 or 500 and so here you can see that actually it doesn't really matter that much on this data set. Um, which one was it? Oh yeah, I'm using the breast cancer data set, which is like a tiny and very simple toy data set. Uh, but I was very impatient and just wanted to illustrate uh, how to do the, the run the grid searches. All right, so this is how you can adjust the different parameters and architecture uh, with scikit-learn. So now I want to go beyond that and talk a little bit more about building more complex architectures and the basics of the deep learning frameworks that people um, use for bigger data sets. So there's uh, two things we're basically going to talk about. One is automatic differentiation and the other one is GPU acceleration. Uh, which are the two things uh, that these deep learning frameworks provide. So let's step back a little bit and think about if you would want to implement your own neural network, what would you have to do? And here's a very simple implementation. Um, you would have a forward and a backward pass. In the forward pass, you always apply a dot between your activation and your coefficients. So in the first layer, it's input times coefficients, and afterwards, it's the hidden layer activations times the coefficients, and you apply nonlinearity. And uh, in the backward pass, you um, compute the gradients. And uh, then maybe you have another function that does like the gradient updates, which adjusts the weight um, according to the gradients that are computed. People found that in particular, in more complex networks, doing this backward pass, so computing the gradients, is uh, quite error-prone and also quite annoying. Every time you try to out a new fancy architecture, you need to make sure you compute the gradients correctly. So, in, so um, what people are using instead these days is what's called automatic uh, differentiation. Automatic differentiation is actually like from a programming perspective, quite simple, but um, from the idea here, quite, quite quite helpful. So here, the idea is that 
whenever you do any operations in your forward pass, the objects store what happened to them and the objects can themselves compute the derivative. So you only need to write down the forward pass, you only need to write down the function, and the function automatically computes its own derivative um, using a chain rule, essentially. There's, here there's an example from the MXNet architect, uh, MXNet uh, to documentation, MXNet is another deep learning framework that shows how you could implement um, automatic differentiation on an array. So here, this array is basically would be a wrapper on a NumPy array. It's so it stores value. Value would be like your NumPy array, but it also um, basically stores a computation graph. So if you add it or multiply it, it's not actually going to do the ad addition or the multiplication. Instead, what it's going to do is it's going to create um, a new object that stores the computation that happened and refers to the arrays that were the inputs. So this basically builds up a computation graph both that you can go both forward to compute a function and backward to compute the gradient. So here basically for each, for each uh, operation, um, let's say for add, we can um, say the, if I want to add other to self, what I return is, so I, here I set the value of the other thing. Sorry, I set the value of the thing I want to return, which is the, your own value plus the, plus the value of the other thing. And the gradient of the thing that I return is um, the gradient um, of self. Because addition doesn't change, uh, like the gradient is additive. So you don't, if you add something, it doesn't change the gradient. And here for multiplication, it's a little bit more complicated. It's the gradient of the matrix multiplication. Um, so here, for this automatic differentiation to work, what you have to do is you have to have um, a vocabulary of operations. Here in this case, it's additional multiplication. And you have to write down for each of these operations once, what is their derivative? How do I compute the gradient with respect to this operation? And then once you have the compute graph, you can, compute, you can um, get the derivatives in a compute graph just by walking through the graph. So if you add a new operation to this, you also need to add, always add the de derivative of this operation. And so um, yeah, here's a very small example where let's say we have A, which is an array, which has this array as a value and A as a name, B, which has this array as a value, and B as a name, and if I compute um, C as B times A, and D as C plus one, then I can look at the value of D, which is uh, four comma, comma nine, and I can um, evaluate the gradient of D with, uh, at one, and this will give me the gradient um, of the input variable. So the gradient with respect to B and respect to A evaluated at one. And this is sort of the basis of all the deep learning frameworks, uh, like Fiano. Well, that doesn't anyone doesn't no one uses this anymore. Like um, like TensorFlow and PyTorch, or Chainer or MXNet. They all implement um, frameworks for doing this automatic differentiation. This is one of the main main things they provide. So you never have to worry about derivatives ever again. Um, the other thing is GPU support. So this is a slide from, from uh, NVIDIA, so maybe sort of trust it, but here you can see that it was uh, in last year's GPU uh, iteration, there were about um, 10 to 30 times faster than doing something on a CPU, and uh, that's quite a lot. So this is using TensorFlow, using um, for image classification or here using some fancy inception architecture. And uh, so 
if your training uh, takes already a long time, so a speed up of factor of 60 means one day or 60 days. And uh, so if your homework is due next week, it makes a big difference if your training takes one day or if it takes 60 days. And uh, similarly for any research. So basically trying to do any um, neural network research or training with, uh, without the GPU doesn't really make a lot of sense these days anymore. And then uh, people uh, also uh, use multiple GPUs or even like when Google trains its uh, networks, they usually use multiple GPUs over multiple machines. So you train uh, this stochastic gradient dis uh, descent is distributed over uh, several machines in a cloud server. And then each machine has multiple GPUs. And uh, at least TensorFlow kind of manages this um, to some degree for you so you can run your neural network training on, um, on a whole cluster of GPUs if you can afford them. Um, I'm not sure, I'm not a PyTorch expert. I'm sure PyTorch also allows doing that, but I'm not, not really familiar with what exactly they're doing. All right, so as I said, uh, one of the um, main components is this automatic differentiation. It works on having a computation graph. Here's just an example of what this might look like for a uh, part of neural network. This is actually from um, TensorBoard, which is a, a GUI for TensorFlow. So here you can see that you have, uh, this is some part of your trading set. Shuffle batch is like, uh, well, something that uh, creates some uh, training data. Here, this goes into a layer called conf1, and then there are some other layers. And each of these has a gradient, and um, it stores like some operation and the gradient of this operation. And so you can go forward to this to get the forward pass, and you can go backward to the, through this to get the derivatives. And so um, traditionally, or more or less traditionally, um, the training, uh, okay, yeah. okay. Uh, the training was um, create this computation graph and then run the computation. But um, in the newest version of TensorFlow, actually they kind of abandoned this and uh, we'll talk a little bit about this in a second. So let's come back to, so wh why do we want to use these deep learning frameworks? So they provide additive, so we don't have to worry about differentiation. You provide uh, GPU support. Um, often they also provide optimization inspection of the compu computation graph. So one great thing is that once you write down this computation graph of what your network needs to compute and what you need to do to compute gradients is you can basically apply a compiler to this and uh, simplify the graph and rewrite it so that it works as fast as possible on a given hardware. That's one of the things uh, TensorFlow does to some degree, um, or earlier frameworks did to some degree. I'm actually not sure if PyTorch does it or how much, but uh, once you write down all your computation as an explicit graph, you can then try to optimize it the way a compiler tries to optimize a program. And so this is potentially much, much faster than like me trying to write out uh, how to multiply NumPy arrays, because then I have to really think about when is the memory allocated, when is the memory freed, which are the things that I need to, can, which results can I overwrite in memory, which results do I need to store, and so on. And um, these computation graph frameworks can figure all of these out um, automatically and efficiently. And um, so these days, people really want on the fly generation of this gra these graphs. The reason is that people use neural networks on more complex objects, for example, on uh, graphs. If you have, um, I think it's most common in like, text processing, basically if you want to parse something, 
uh, you have usually have a parsing tree and you want to walk al along the parsing tree and you only know what the architecture is once you have your sample and you have the parse tree of your sample. So your architecture, the way it looks, depends on your input. And if your architecture depends on your input, you can't compute this graph beforehand. And so people like to uh, generate these uh, graphs on the fly. Also, it allows you to make dynamic decisions, uh, like just uh, write a program that tells you how to generate the graph for a given example. So the choices right now for um, computational frameworks uh, are TensorFlow by Google, PyTorch, Build on Torch by um, Facebook, Chainer. I don't know who's behind Chainer, actually. Um, and CNTK, which is backed by Microsoft. These all do basically what I just said, which is auto-diff, GPUs, cluster distribution, and so on. And um, then this gives you sort of, in a sense, this replaces sort of NumPy for scikit-learn. These only give you the low-level operations of um, dealing with um, computation graphs and uh, computing derivatives. They don't really give you neural networks. Um, well, Chainer does to some degree. Then on top of these, you have deep learning libraries. And these deep learning libraries are what actually implement neural networks. And um, so in this class, we'll only work on the level of the deep learning libraries. We're not going to go down to the model to these uh, other frameworks. So the thing that we're going to be using is Keras. Keras can use TensorFlow, CNTK, or Theano as a backend. Theano was an open source project from the University of Montreal. It was basically the first deep learning like computation backend, but well, I guess one of the first. I guess the, yeah, yeah uh, Jan Lacan had one in the 90s that, that came before. So, um, but Theano is no longer developed, so most people these days use either TensorFlow or PyTorch. And yeah, so there's also Chainer and MXNet. MXNet is mostly backed by Amazon these days, I think. Um, and uh, so these are implementations. Uh, they're usually together with a particular computation backend. So Keras allows multiple different computation backends. Most uh, deep learning libraries just work with one computation in a backend. Um, yeah, so a different, uh, a big difference between these was also which of these uh, use a static graph, so they compute, they get to do a compute graph bef uh, beforehand, and then you later on compute on it. Um, and TensorFlow had this. Um, very explicit notion of a compute graph before, but in TensorFlow 2.0, which came out this year, they basically, by default, switch to what they call eager mode. Eager mode means you don't first build the graph and then execute the graph, but you just execute while you're doing stuff. And so now all of these, I think, um, have this uh, eager mode, and so they all kind of um, have the same paradigms. Very briefly on, on the difference between sort of this eager mode and the, uh, the, the traditional one is basically before what you had is you built a computation graph, then um, you create an optimizer that works on a, a computation graph, and then you run the actual algorithm. Um, and so here's, a, here's an example of what this might look like for um, linear regression. So here, I have like this very simple 1D linear regression. And here, uh, we create a model graph saying y is uh, w times x theta plus b. And we want to get w and b. And so here, this line, there's no computation. This sort of here says, oh, I want to have the square and then do the mean. So this is the mean squared to error between uh, the y that I computed and the y that I observed. And this, all of this just set up um, the computation graph. And then later on, I create like um, 
a TensorFlow session and uh, inside the session, I run an optimizer on this graph. So this was sort of, um, I mean, this is actually a very nice and um, efficient way to do this. But I think people didn't think it was flexible enough or people had a hard time like wrapping their head around it and they preferred PyTorch. And so a lot of people went to PyTorch and then uh, TensorFlow changed their interface um, to not do this anymore and use eager mode instead. Anyway, there's lots, there's lots of new tutorials out there because it's such a big change and you can find lots of great TensorFlow tutorials. Um, yeah, so one is at tensorflow.org slash tutorials. Another thing that I uh, encourage you to play with is playground.tensorflow.org, um, which allows you to like click around a neural network and like change the architecture, change the learning rates, and see a visualization of how the weights evolve on some toy data sets. Um, so this was a little bit on like sort of the background of these uh, architectures. So the only thing we're really going to get into is um, how to use Keras. Many of these are pretty similar, but I'm more concerned about showing you the high level interface that you can actually use. Um, and I think Keras is sort of the nicest for those. All right, uh, that's it for today. <laughs>